Okay, so thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Jonathan Firth. Um, Jonathan is based at the School of Education at the University of Strathclyde. He previously worked as a secondary school teacher for many years, which I think I'm going to tell you a little bit about. His research examines the psychology of cognition and metacognition, uh, also looking at study skills, learning theory and cognitive basis of well-being. Uh, he's written several educational guides and support books for teachers and students, um, including How to Learn, Creative Thinking, Psychology in the Classroom with Mark Smith, the Teacher's Guide to Research, and also several psychology books. So today he's going to be talking to us about his work on interleaving and how this can be used as a classroom and study technique across the curriculum. Um, so if you want to put questions, I'm going to hand over to, to Jonathan in one step and um, one second. If you want to pop questions in the chat as we go so you don't forget them or at the end we can go through the chat or you can raise your hand and ask questions but for now I'm going to turn off my camera and hand over to Jonathan who will share his screen and tell us all about interleaving. Thank you Jonathan. Uh, thanks very much Rebecca. Um, real pleasure to be here with you all today and uh, to speak about learning science related stuff. I'll just share this slide and uh, before I say anything else. Um, so yeah, great series of, of talks here. So it's, um, yeah, it's a real privilege to uh, contribute to that. Um, as um, Rebecca said, my topic is around, and I'm sure you know <laughs> since you came along, uh, my topic is about the use of interleaving across the curriculum. Um, so interleaving is something that is uh, discussed quite a bit within the idea of evidence-based teaching practice. So um, I think hopefully you'll find if you are a practitioner or if you're interested in the use of uh, cognitive science and application of cognitive science to the classroom, then hopefully you'll find something uh, pretty interesting in what I'm going to talk about today. And I'll certainly take some questions at the end. I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on questions as I go through as well. I can't promise I'm, I may fail to notice the, the chat, but we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, just a, a brief introduction of myself before I say too much more about the topic. Um, as, as Rebecca said, um, I, I worked as a secondary school teacher prior to, um, prior to my current post. Just, uh, I suppose, a, a very brief potted history. So I did my degree in psychology. I, I worked abroad as a English teacher of English as a foreign language that you know when I was in my early 20s that was kind of my first teaching uh, post and then I worked in adult education just by one reason or kind of roundabout route ended up teaching uh, psychology as a secondary school teacher and did that for a number of years um, and then just really kind of became interested I guess in um, how I could actually use some of my psychology background um, in the classroom and particularly um, started reading some things about long-term memory and thought, you know, hey, maybe I could sort of utilize some of this, these long-term memory ideas and actually help my students to retain stuff a bit better and, um, you know, so they'll, so they'll do better in their, in their courses and understand things better and that kind of thing. So that was really what got me into reading about things like interleaving and the spacing effect and a few other things that I'm sure some of you um, will, have, will have heard of and ended up doing my PhD in, in those kind of areas. and. Um, now I mainly work in teacher education, uh, developing new teachers, but you know, still very, very kind of focused on how we apply this stuff to the classroom. That's my dog, I guess. <laughs> That's the other thing to say. Um, uh, I live in I live in Scotland, so if you're not familiar, University of Strathclyde's in, in in Glasgow. So my familiarity is more with the Scottish system, but I have um, had occasion to travel to to London and other parts of the world as well. So that's about me. I guess in terms of um, the other thing really is the, the background to the topic. And I just wanted to sort of say a few things about what interleaving actually is. Some of you may already have a pretty good grasp of what it is. Um, but in case you're fairly new to it, um, I'll just kind of run through some of the basic ideas. Um, so it falls within what are sometimes called desirable difficulties. So this was a, a term coined by Robert Bjork and his colleagues about a group of activities which um, are counterintuitive and they seem to be unhelpful because they're more difficult and make learning feel harder, they lead to more mistakes, they often slow learners down, but yet they boost learning um, over the long run. So spacing out our practice, distributed practice is another example of this. 
uh, self-explanation, so asking learners to kind of reflect and explain a concept rather than just telling them about it, and um, interleaving um, uh, could be put into that, that category. So, I mean, there's, I'm going to come on to this sort of metacognitive side in a bit, but it's worth knowing that, noting that because these things are, um, because they feel harder, that learners quite often don't do them, they, they quite often avoid them and uh, assume that it's unhelpful uh, to do these things. Uh, so what exactly do we mean by interleaving? So interleaving essentially means uh, taking particular items and putting them in an order such that they are in some way shuffled or, um, in, um, or alternated so that rather than having one item of a particular type and then another item of the same type and then another item of the same type, you would have contrasting items. Now I'll kind of come back to what exactly we mean by items uh, and talk about that a fair bit. Um, but you could look at the image there and say, well, if, if learners were learning what owls and hawks were, for example, then a, a traditional approach might be, okay, here's our lesson about owls on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, we have a lesson about hawks. Whereas interleaving would be saying, well, actually we should kind of have you know, some hawks and some owls together. Um, and, and by doing so, learners are able to kind of compare and contrast. So when we, when we learn a, a, a new concept, we kind of need to know not just what it is, but also what it isn't. And interleaving helps us perhaps to understand the boundaries of a new conceptual idea. So it might seem you know, fairly easy to know what the difference between an owl and a hawk is, but you could perhaps imagine if you were kind of understand, uh, learning about um, uh, different kinds of owls, they may be quite similar looking, um, or if you were learning about um, what's the difference between a hawk and a falcon or, or that kind of thing. Um, that actually seeing two similar but, but actually importantly different uh, uh, things ex side by side would, would allow you to can, can compare and contrast those and understand where the boundaries uh, lie. So in terms of this sort of experimental research into it, it often just involves two conditions, one where you put a whole bunch of different examples of a thing um, that are of the same category, um, and one where you muddle together the categories. So we see an example from this category and an example from that one, and maybe a third one, maybe a fourth one, and then repeat like that. Um, and in terms of what does that do? Well, the evidence seems to suggest that there's a fairly strong benefit of interleaving compared to learning things in blocks of the same type. Um, so a couple of um, systematic reviews with meta-analysis, including one by myself and my colleagues that actually began as part of my PhD thesis, um, finding effect sizes up in the region of 0 .6, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, which is you know, putting up there with what we consider as some of the more strongly evidence-based um, strategies um, you know, in the same ballpark as things like metacognitive strategies. Um, and, and fairly consistently as well uh, across different kinds of material. So again, I'll, I'll come up, I'll come on to in this talk, talking about some of the different ways we can use uh, interleaving. But you know, it's not just um, examples of birds. Although it has been done as the experimental task. But you know, you could imagine if you were learning about, um, let's say, learners were learning about an oxbow lake and geography. Well. You know, you perhaps wouldn't want to just show them lots of examples of oxbow lakes. I mean, you could do that. That would be blocked learning. Interleaved learning would say, here's an oxbow lake and here's another lake that isn't one, a glacial lake or whatever. And then you have contrast. You can see the differences. You can see why these things are different and do that perhaps in the same lesson. Now, a couple of sort of um, things to mention, uh, like a lot of evidence-based uh, strategies, it's not necessarily just a case of let's do this all the time and problem solved. But it does depend, like so many things in education, on exactly how do you do it, what's the best way of doing it. Um, and one important thing I think to, to bear in mind is that the experimental work has shown that the benefit is stronger when the difference is subtle. So um, in the example of the, the hawks and the owls, like I was saying, you might find that they're not very different. Nobody's going to mix up a hawk and an owl. Um, they're probably very unlikely to mix up an owl and a fish. You know? So the more different things are, the less benefit there's going to be from interleaving uh, those different things. Um, it's really helpful if things are confusable. So, you know, if you are a classroom practitioner, you could perhaps think about some of the stuff that you teach and think, what do, what do, the, what do the students get mixed up um, between? 
you know, and it's not, I was going to say kids, but it's, it's not just kids, you know, really any age of learner. What do the learners get mixed up? But, you know, what, what do they tend to confuse? Well, if they, if they get confused between these two things that are actually importantly different, that might well be something that would be beneficial, beneficial to interleave examples or interleave uh, practice problems. Um, one other thing to say about that is in the classroom, the similarity might depend on the learner. Um, so whether something is subtly different or not is not just a function of the material itself, but it also depends on who is looking at it. So something that might seem very obviously different to you might look quite similar to me. Um, a hawk and an owl might seem quite obviously different to an adult, but they might not be obviously different to a four-year-old. Um, and something that is you know, very kind of uh, a sort of technical difference that's very obvious to an expert who's worked in a field for, for decades might be very unclear as to what the, exactly the distinction is to a, to a novice. So you, your past learning is going to make a difference as to whether things are subtly different or not. Um, so basic maths concepts that are you know, brand new in primary school may seem quite subtly different, but may be very obviously different by the time you get to secondary school. Um, just to give you a sort of an, a, an example from the research. So this is the, the birds example again. So this was from a paper by um, Monica Birnbaum and colleagues. Um, and you can perhaps see from these examples that you, if you show people a picture of a bird and then you show them a picture of another bird, um, these are all, these four are all different species, but you know you can imagine if you saw them on different occasions, they might kind of look similar-ish, and it's actually helpful to see them side by side and say, oh well, the feathers on that one are actually kind of speckled, those ones are not, and that one has different feathers around its head and things like that. If you if you saw them on two different days, it would be considerably harder, perhaps, um, you know, to retain those differences, um, whereas seeing them within the same study session. Is going to make it that little bit easier. I mean, clearly, if they're on the screen right next to each other, that helps too. But even if it was just a few seconds ago, so that might still be in your in your working memory, um, then it's perhaps easier to make those contrasts. And and more often, the interleaving is actually one example and then the other and then the other consecutively, rather than showing them all simultaneously. Um, in terms of theoretical explanations of why interleaving is helpful, um, one which I've kind of touched on already. Um, proposed by Sean Kang and Harp Ashler is that it helps us, it, it helps to bring focus to contrast. So the so-called discriminative contrast hypothesis suggests that by placing contrasting items together, it makes it a bit easier for us to notice the differences. So it makes it a bit easier for us to categorize things correctly and therefore it makes it a bit easier for us to learn um, uh, about those categories and to develop our conceptual knowledge. Another explanation, um, from Cavallio and Goldstone is that it affects our attention. Um, and this is a similar explanation that's been used with the spacing effect. So if I give you an example of a sparrow and then another example of a sparrow and then another example of a sparrow, well, you're gonna get bored after a little while and you can stop paying attention. So it's a bit like with the spacing effect that if you just have example after example of the same kind, your, your attention will start to drift. So their, their idea was that people are gonna focus their attention more if they see a contrasting item. Then I give you something new and something else new and something else new. You're going to pay more attention. And if you pay more attention, it's more likely to go into long term memory. Um, so I think that 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 could be true. Um, but I think possibly over the long term, it's really the. the dis, for me, anyway, the more compelling explanation, the discriminative contrast idea, because I think it is about learning conceptual knowledge. It's about learning where the boundaries of a category of a schema maybe lie and, and, and distinguishing between two, two things and recognizing that these are actually two conceptually different things, I think is an important part of a lot of types of, types of learning. Um, when it comes to a skill, such as a math skill, recognizing when you should use it and when you shouldn't, um, and the contrast between perhaps one type of maths problem and a superficially similar maths problem that you perhaps need to tackle in a different way. Or likewise in science, perhaps, a, you know, two experiments which superficially look quite similar but are actually working or telling us something quite fundamentally different. Um, so I think those, the, the contrast is, is pretty important. <laughs> of course, despite all of what I said about this being evidence-based and having a strong effect size, it's not necessarily what happens in classrooms. So this is my son's maths homework. Um, what you often see is that in the classroom, we get a lot of blocked practice. So we get a lot of Lots of the same kind of problem, um, 
one after the other, one after the other, you know, of, of the same thing again and again and again. Um, and then maybe at some point in a future lesson, we might look at something conceptually different. Uh, so the contrasts do exist, but they might occur um, in different lessons. Um, so it's making it perhaps for the learner a little bit harder to recognize when do I use this structure, when do I use that one. And perhaps this is influenced more by things like uh, behaviorist um, thinking in that perhaps we need to kind of overlearn or reinforce learning rather than perhaps thinking about the conceptual learning and, and what we know from uh, theories of long-term memory and theories of schemas that perhaps understanding conceptual differences is pretty important and we need to emphasize those. So um, uh, this talk is about uses of interleaving across the curriculum. So I wanted to say a few things about how it's been applied across the teaching profession. And I would say that although it's perhaps not as well known as things like the spacing effect and retrieval practice, it certainly has been talked about uh, you know, quite a bit in education. Um, and it's a good, good few years since I first heard about it, um, um, you know, having been working as a, as a school teacher. Um, one example is um, the Learning Sciences website, really nice website, which is, has lots of accessible things for kids and for parents, videos, posters, that kind of thing. And they have this thing, six strategies for effective learning, you know, plastered across their website in various places. And you can see that one of those um, in the bullet pointed list at the bottom there, one of those is, is interleaving. So they consider this an evidence-based strategy and one that's important enough to put alongside uh, those other um, well-founded strategies as well. So it's out there and uh, people are hearing about it and, um, you know, there's, it's being advised by various people and quite a few sort of reports into evidence-based practice, uh, what makes good teaching and things like that have, have recommended it. In terms of what we're actually using into leaving for, um, you know, from my own um, co-authored uh, systematic review of interleaving, one of the things we did was look at what kinds of materials had been used in the experiments of interleaving. And you can see a, a screenshot of that, of that here. So various different research studies um, uh, using various different stimuli. And you can see these potentially apply to quite a lot of different subjects across the curriculum. So this is something that, you know, if you're an art teacher, well, there's a load of studies that have looked at using the styles of art um, and, and interleaving those in order to kind of learn the difference between the style of one painter and another, for example. Um, there is, biology related stuff, not just animals, but things like cells, there's chemical molecules, there's examples of physiology, there's examples of statistics, there's examples of psychology definitions. Um, so, you know, it's not absolutely every subject in the curriculum, but there's quite a broad range, including um, not just images, but also passages, so passages from medicine, passages of um, definitions of, or actually case studies of psychological disorders. So, this is an example of schizophrenia. This is an example of bipolar disorder and kind of interleaving those. So you can see it's been used for quite a lot of different uh, kinds of things. And we didn't actually include everything here um, because we decided not to focus in on maths and language learning just because they brought up some different issues. So that, that this was even just a subsection. In terms of language learning, I would say that's a fairly emergent, newish kind of area of use of interleaving, but I think the evidence is quite promising. And if you think about um, how we learn things like grammatical rules, well, it, it actually works quite well with a lot of what I've said. You need to kind of know when to use it and when not to use it. And you need to kind of, uh, and you can see perhaps a benefit of practicing examples of a different kind rather than a class, perhaps more typically, where you have lots and lots of sentences that show the one grammatical rule. You know, you, you could see how that would be quite easy potentially to say, well, let's interleave this, let's compare it to uh, different kinds of grammatical uh, structures. Um, and there is some evidence, for example, the um, study by Pan et al there um, has, has found that interleaving of uh, language learning is beneficial. There's a much uh, stronger sort of um, uh, evidence base, I suppose, in maths, which has been, uh, the, well, the research, a lot of it is done by Doug Rohrer and colleagues, but certainly it's been going on for probably the longest out of these different areas of, of the curriculum. Um, lots and lots of research into maths learning, really strong body of evidence. And one interesting thing that Rohrer and colleagues said um, in their 2015 paper is that if you interleave different types of maths problems, not only does it help you 
remember how to do those problems better. But it also sort of develops exam skills because in an exam, you don't get told how to do the problem. If you think about it in a maths class, you sit there, maybe the teacher goes through how to do a particular kind of problem and then gives you 10 examples. Well, you, you know the strategy. They just told you what to do. And then you do it again and again and again. That's not what happens in the exam. In the exam, you come to question four and it's like, well, what do I do? You know, you have to decide the strategy for yourself. Um, and according to Rohrer and colleagues, that's, you know, interleave learning is a lot more like that. You have to kind of figure out what to do um, and not select the wrong strategy. They show how this could be combined with spacing. So um, if you look at the number in the diagram, if you look at the numbers on the top, they're kind of like the weeks of the year. So if you have week 25, we've spent some time practicing a particular skill in class that day, then I'm going to give you a homework task with 12 items. The first four items are going to consolidate what we've been doing in class. And then the next eight items are each plucked from earlier weeks of the year. So we're going to then consolidate eight different kinds of problems. Um, uh, so this is an example of kind of interleaving in a homework task. And then you could take the ones that we worked on today that, that are represented by the black squares and sort of sprinkle those through homework tasks for the subsequent weeks. Now, it is worth noting in terms of what I was saying before about comparing and contrasting, that this is more about practice than initial learning. So a lot of the evidence base that I uh, spoke about before is really about learning a new concepts. The experiments were showing learners something they hadn't seen before. So it could be learning a new psychological disorder that you never heard about before and giving examples of that. Or it could be learning a new species of animal and, and giving examples of that. That's not really what's happening here. What's happening here is they're being taught in a more traditional way. And then the practice, the homework or the consolidation is interleaved. And I think it's worth bearing in mind just that there's a subtle difference there, but I think an important one to bear in mind. This recent study, I didn't really have much time to, to this, as you can see, it came out April 2022. So this is uh, hot off the presses from um, Sana and Yan, really good research that's not done a lot in this area. But it's a, it's a good example, again, of, of practice based um, use of interleaving, uh, in this case in science. So using quizzes, you can combine interleaving retrieval practice by interleaving quiz questions on various different topics from your science course. Um, and you can see at the bottom, persistence perform better on concepts that have been on the interleaved quizzes than the blocked quizzes. And it's worth bearing in mind, I'll kind of come back to this point as well, but it's worth bearing in mind, you've got to do, you've got to do it in some order or another. So it's not as if interleaving is like an extra thing that you do. You, you have to decide, you know, you're either going to present them all together with the same topic or mixed you know, there's not, there's not really another option. So um, interleaving is really just changing the order. It's not doing a new strategy or adding something we wouldn't otherwise be doing. You're just doing the same stuff in a different order. Um, so that potentially makes it um, kind of appealing to teachers because they can just take their existing materials and, um, and reschedule them. Um, so I, I kind of touched on in the beginning that it's not necessarily the case that learners would really kind of pick up on these desirable difficulties because they seem more challenging, they seem to slow them down. And I want to say a little bit about some of the misconceptions that can arise. So, as I said, interleaving has become widely discussed in education, or at least among people who care about evidence-based practice. Um, but it's worth thinking, are we all on the same page? Are we all talking about the same thing? And if we choose to apply interleaving, are we actually applying it even in the right way? Um, and if not, then potentially it might not be very effective. Um, so I think, you know, first problem then to think about is, do teachers understand what interleaving is um, and how to apply it? Uh, and are they actually applying it in the way that is concordant with what the research evidence um, has shown? And a kind of connected problem is, do the learners understand what interleaving is? So when it comes to things like independent learning or maybe using quiz questions by themselves or flashcards or just their own kind of scheduling of their exam revision like a lot of young people are doing right now, are they actually gonna be able to apply this themselves? So I think it's useful to consider um, the idea of learning versus performance um, uh, as, as a kind of explanation for this. And, um, this is a, a really good paper by Soderstrom and Bjork points out that what we're really trying to do in education is get people to learn. We're trying to get them to retain things, skills, knowledge, in a way that they can retain over the long term and then use them. Okay, so that's learning. 
But what they see is that what's happening during practice is performance. So you can have a bunch of kids who come in, they answer your questions, they leave at the end of the lesson feeling pretty confident, but they've only really demonstrated performance. They haven't really demonstrated learning because you don't know whether they're still going to be able to do that in six months' time. And in fact, Soderstrom and Bjork say that really learning is a very, sorry, performance is a very unreliable index of whether learning has taken place. So the fact that you've done it well in practice is a really poor and often kind of negatively correlated with how well you've learned it. The easier the practice is, the worse it is for learning. So what you actually want to do is bring in more of these difficulties and actually slow down and cause more and promote more mistakes during the practice process because they'll actually then retain it better. So, you know, all of these desirable difficulties, quizzes, spacing, interleaving, are, are kind of making it harder in, in the practice process. Um, but, you know, teachers might then think that they are observing learning when they're actually observing performance and they might avoid things like interleaving because they might say, well, the learners seem to find this a bit confusing, so maybe we shouldn't do it. They don't really like that very much. They'd rather we just kind of focus on nice. We'll just make it really simple for them. We'll just do one thing at a time. We won't bring in too many variables. I think it's interesting, just a, a slight tangent, but real life is interleaved. Um, we've evolved over millions of years in an environment that is interleaved. You know, we don't, things weren't neatly categorized for ourselves during human evolution. We would see things, you know, in a much more random way. Um, our brains have kind of set up to learn in this kind of way of kind of categorizing things that come at us in a much more chaotic way. But in education, we often say, well, never mind about that. We're just going to kind of neatly make it simple for the learners. But perhaps by making it simple, categorizing it, having it into neat little topics, isn't actually doing them a service. It might actually be making it harder over the long term. I guess another issue is how well can we expect teachers to engage with things like evidence and interleaving because you know we involve reading research papers and teachers have limited time. There certainly are some people who have said, for example, Dan, Daniel William has said, really don't, don't expect teachers to read theories, just tell them what works. Um, and I can understand that argument. Um, but at the same time, as I was mentioning before, even a quite a robust effect like spacing or interleaving can be quite context specific. Interleaving can work if you're dealing with subtly different contrasts, but if you're dealing with really obvious contrast, it could be pointless or it could even be counterproductive. Um, if you are dealing with things that are rather mean subtly different are subtly similar, so perhaps you have four different pieces of evidence in history that have something in common, but it's not that easy to tell what those four things have in common. Well, it would actually be better to block your learning then so you could actually see what the commonality is. Um, so in, you know, depending what the material is and depending who the learners are, um, you can't really just say interleaving work to do it. Uh, I do think there has to be some kind of understanding of what's happening and how long-term memory works and how learning works. Um, if teachers are going to apply that uh, successfully. Um, I showed a little bit earlier a list of examples of different kinds of things that um, have been interleaved in the research literature. And one of those was um, example of psychological disorders. So there were some texts, but they were quite short. So even the very longest of them was only around about 100 words um, long. But I think that sometimes if you look at how interleaving is discussed, it's often implied that we're doing something quite a lot longer. Um, for example, entire topics, entire chunks of topics or entire activities um, should be interleaved. So I, uh, this was one from TES. I don't particularly want to kind of <laughs> uh, just take a pot shot at this article, which is perfectly nice. But, uh, you know, when it says things like um, uh, interleaving replaces block learning. Block learning is when students cover topic one at a time and it goes on to talk about this. I think sometimes the implication of, uh, of the way interleaving is talked about is like we should maybe do topic one on Monday, topic two on Tuesday, topic three on Wednesday, that kind of thing, instead of covering the same topic for like a couple of months. If you think about everything I've been saying about interleaving, it really involves contrasting quite small items, you know, not a 10 minute activity, not a half an hour activity. And if you think about it, if you contrast something that you maybe show one example for a few seconds and then another example for a few seconds, and then a third example from a different category for a few seconds, you're getting a lot of contrast. You're getting a lot of contrast between category one, category two, category three. If we spend half an hour on category one, 
and then half an hour on category two, and that's the end of the lesson. Well, you've only had one point at the halfway mark where there's been a kind of interface between those two categories that's allowed contrast. And yeah, you could say, well, probably they still remember some things from the beginning of the lesson, but you're certainly making it harder um, to contrast if you're even talking about five or 10 or 15 or 30 minute activities and then moving on to the next topic and then going back. That's not really what the evidence tells us is effective either. And I think we have to sort of consider like, can we call it an evidence-based strategy? We're not using it the way that the evidence used it. The evidence used really short items, examples and contrast, uh, you know, one and then immediately the next and then back to the first and so on. The same article talked about interleaving of reading and listening might be helpful, but there isn't really a research literature that, that says that it is. I think probably it could be useful, um, but it's quite speculative. So again, we're kind of going quite far from the evidence base if we start you know, just kind of inventing new things that we could use interleaving for without, without that evidence base to, to go on. And it's quite possible that it wouldn't be as helpful for some topics in the, in the curriculum, we, we really don't know. Um, I mentioned before uh, research looking at painting styles and one of the most well-known ones um, by Cornell and Bjork. It was really quite early in terms of the literature I've been talking about, which, you know, as you can see, 2008 is not that long ago. But this really kind of kick-started a lot of the more recent interest in interleaving. Um, and one of the things they found was that the participants who were students really didn't understand that they had learned better through interleaving, even though they'd done it. So they sat there, they'd done it. They did this task where they had to, so just to explain this a little bit, I imagine that some of you know a little bit about famous artists. So if you were to see a painting by somebody like Kandinsky, you could, and you'd never seen it before, you could probably say, oh, well, that looks like a Kandinsky painting. I can recognize the style. So what they were saying, what they were trying to do is kind of viewing that as a category, as a mental category. How do we learn to recognize a previously unseen painting? And they either presented relatively obscure painters, uh, the work of relatively obscure painters in a blocked session. So you saw eight examples by the same same artist or in an interleaved way. So you saw artist one, then artist two, then artist three. So different paintings every time. And they found the interleaved learning was the better way of learning painting styles, discriminating between the style of one artist and the style of the next. Because again, you've got more contrasts. Um, but they also found that 83% of the participants thought that they had learned better Either or either equal or better through the through the um, blocked approach, and they said they didn't can think of any other study that had shown such inaccuracy of judgment. It's really counterintuitive. Even if you've tried it out, you don't necessarily recognise that you've learned better this way. And although that was a lab experiment, there's a recent study by um, uh, Hartwig et al. which found a, a very similar thing in terms of student judgments of spacing effect and interleaving in a in a field study. Um, they tend, participants tend to think that minimizing spacing and interleaving would be the best strategy. So in terms of student metacognition, they're not likely to choose to do this uh, if you just leave them to their own devices. So somebody's going to need to guide them as to, as to how to do that. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to return to some of the implications. I just want to first of all say a little bit about a use of interleaving that hasn't been investigated that much and what, which I tried to look into. Um, and that is learning of skills, by which I mean um, the kind of thinking skills that we have to use in, in academic courses. So obviously, if you're, if you're studying um, uh, a subject at school or university, you need knowledge and understanding. But there's often a requirement to learn skills such as evaluation and analysis. Um, I was a school secondary, I was a secondary psychology teacher, and it was quite a big deal to be able to evaluate research or analyze theories, that kind of thing. So, for example, some of you might have heard of the Milgram study of obedience. Pupils would be asked maybe to describe that study or to evaluate that study or to analyze that study or to explain that study. And the answer would be different according to which of those command words were used. And I thought, you know, from what, what I knew about interleaving, it seems to me that actually interleaving examples of analysis versus evaluation or analysis versus explanation or description versus analysis or description versus um, evaluation would be potentially quite useful. Um, it, could, it could have some of the same benefits because it's allowing them to compare and contrast and recognize the differences um, between the skills. 
So just briefly in terms of what I did, I did a field experiment um, with around about 100 participants. We used higher psychology. We don't really have A-level much in Scotland. The sort of higher psychology is the most taught school course in uh, psychology. And it was from the syllabus. So this is something they, they, they were learning anyway. And not only that, teachers tend to um, talk about um, their pupils' ability to analyze theories and analyze research studies as one of the major stumbling blocks, something that the kids really find quite difficult and that is, is really a big emphasis on them to, to do this better. And the exam board SQA, so this is a major reason for, for underachievement. So I won't go too much into the design, but basically the, the contrasted examples of description versus evaluation and explanation versus analysis. And uh, half of the half of the students were asked to then explain or self-explain, write a description for themselves of what they thought those skills were, and the other half um, were not. Partly because self-explanation is also recognised as a desirable difficulty, and there's evidence um, that it can be effective. Um, so I won't go too much into the, the nitty-gritty of the findings, but you can see the sort of mean percentage down the second column there. Um, you can see that the interleaving condition um, sc scored higher. Um, I mean, it's not miles higher, but they scored better, you know, both groups did better than they did in the pretest at the beginning. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind, this was a relatively brief intervention. So they only did this for about 20 minutes. So you could potentially do that again and again and again through the course of an academic year. And uh, you might see then that pattern sort of expanding. Um, not, not that I've done that, but you know, that it would be, it would be plausible. And you could certainly say, well, it's, they're still not doing very well, even after the interval, even they're still only getting 47% right. But as I said, it's worth bearing in mind that this has been recognized by the exam board as one of the major barriers. And to be able to make a, an impact on it in, you know, less than half a lesson is, 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 is decent. Um, and it was a significant difference. So I think that it's promising, even if it's, it's only a, you know, it's only sort of first steps towards that. In terms of the self-explanation, there was a significant benefit of self-explanation versus not doing that. Um, so those who wrote definitions of the skills did a little bit better, but the effect was quite marginal. And it's also worth bearing in mind that the self-explanation took longer. So if you ask learners, sit and write down and reflect, and what do you think evaluation is? What do you think analysis is? But it takes time. So on average, they were taking around about 11, 12% longer to do the task, whereas the interleaving versus blocking doesn't, it doesn't take any longer because they're looking at the same examples, just in a different order. So again, in terms of the practicality of these strategies, there's not really a downside um, to, uh, in certain terms of learning time, to doing interleaving. Um, I did ask about metacognitive judgments here again, and not quite as extreme a, um, a finding as Cornell and Bjork had, but the majority of them were judging blocking to be superior, and they also, there was no significant link between what judgment they made about the strategies and how well they actually did. So they were basically, it, it was no more than a guess in terms of which one led to them learning better. Um, so they, they, they couldn't figure it out from having done it. Okay, so I'm going to talk finally about a few of the implications of all the things I've been talking about. I'm just sort of sticking with the skills learning stuff for a little bit. Clearly, that was one field study, but, you know, we need a bit more investigation. That was in psychology learning. It'd be good to look at skills learning in other subjects. I don't know if any of you are English teachers, but I think an interesting one would be um, students' ability to engage in reading skills. Um, and perhaps also their ability to do things like recognising different genres. Um, again, that's the sort of thing that perhaps would tend to be blocked in general teaching practice, but it might be interesting to think about actually, if you compare and contrast directly, here's an example of this genre of writing versus this, maybe that makes it easier for them to recognize um, you know, what, what the, the key characteristics of those categories are. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind in terms of investigating skills that in practice, skills and knowledge are very closely tied together. Um, but nevertheless, I think it is worth um, having some emphasis on skills because they're so often valued by examiners and by, by courses. And uh, some other research into retrieval practice by Pooja Agarwal suggested that rather than just focusing on factual knowledge and trying to boost that, like the sort of Bloom's taxonomy might suggest is you know, build the foundational knowledge, um, that study found evidence that actually tackling both factual knowledge, so doing retrieval practice and retrieval practice for skills-based questions was, was more valuable. So it could be the same with interleaving uh, 
skills-based things and interleaving fact-based things. In terms of the misconceptions I spoke about before that, I think there is a danger that um, ideas like interleaving kind of trickle into the profession in a not very well explained way and that practitioners may be picking this up as well this is something I should be doing but they might not actually be doing it the way the researchers had in mind. So I think that we need dialogue between researchers and practitioners, we need researchers to be writing things that are accessible for, for teachers, um, we need to have teachers have ways of accessing um, research expertise so they can they can ask questions and, and, and sort of get some guidance. Um, I think we should avoid going beyond the evidence. So interleaving provides us with evidence that some things are effective, but let's not just assume it's always going to be effective in every scenario with every age group and every subject. I think let's, let's be a little bit more cautious than that. Um, although, <laughs> having said that, you know, that you do have to present things in some order or another. I think if you if you have to make a judgment and you and there isn't really a, a study that shows your particular topic or your particular area, um, then like I said before, I think focusing on the things where misconceptions tend to arise, where where pupils mix things up or students mix things up, if you can interleave and compare and contrast easily confused things from your area, that's probably the where it's most likely to have a benefit. A lot of the research that I spoke about earlier. Uh, is lab studies with fairly artificial stimuli. So you can see I was trying to do something a little bit more field-based, a little bit more based on actual curriculum materials. So I think we need a little bit more of that and in other uh, subject areas. And as I touched on before, I think that when it comes to, does the interleaving relate to the initial learning of a concept that learners haven't come across before, or does it relate to consolidation and practice? I think sometimes we need to be clear about that, not just sort of, in. I think often people make an assumption that interleaving is one of those things or the other, and we we ought to define it perhaps. Maybe we even need slightly different terminology or call these things slightly different things rather than calling both of them interleaving. When it comes to student misconceptions, the evidence we have from other areas of, of misconceptions like student belief in learning myths, for example, the evidence seems to suggest the best way to do that is really just to tackle it head on, just to say, look, a lot of people believe this, but it's not true, and here's why, rather than expecting them to kind of pick it up. Um, so they may feel it is best if they spend the whole of Saturday focusing topic one and the whole Sunday focusing topic two when they're revising, and maybe explain to them that that may actually have its downsides if they, if they do that. Um, I think I mentioned before that uh, teachers can't avoid interleaving or blocking. They have to present things in, in some order or another. If you're gonna give several examples, there has to be an order. So there is the benefit that interleaving doesn't require, like the spacing effect, doesn't require new materials necessarily. It may just require reorganization. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that compared to things like self-explanation, that may also be an evidence-based desirable difficulty, but it's an add-on, it's an extra. It's gonna take more time. Whereas interleaving, it, it, we can, in, in situations where it's appropriate, is not actually going to add any time, any learning time, but may make things more effective. Um, so again, in terms of metacognition evidence, it's probably reasonable to assume that both students and teachers will be unaware of the benefits of interleaving, even if they try out the tasks. They may try it and they may think they've actually done worse when, they, when, they, when they've actually learned better over the long run. So I think that um, more generally, um, there's a bit of evidence or, you know, to me, it seems to, that the discourse around interleaving is sometimes flawed, sometimes inaccurate. Um, we can't just call things evidence-based strategies and assume they're always going to work. We need to think about when they work and in what situation. Um, make sure the advice is accurate, obviously, but also maybe avoid overgeneralizing it. And I think just a sort of last thing to really say on that is that to me we can't really get away from the fact that we can't really expect kids to know that we can't really expect parents to know that so who's going to know it it's it's going to be the practitioners so I think there has to be an emphasis placed on practitioners developing a clear theory based understanding of what memory is how it works and how it applies to practice and the practitioners are then in the position to guide the learners to do that which I think they should do like not like, the week before their GCSE exams, but you know, we should probably be doing that quite a bit earlier. So they start to develop this almost like user guide of how their own memory works. 
Um, so you can see from the references there, this is something that I've been thinking about and, and writing about that. I really think that it's valuable for teachers to understand uh, memory and you know, they're the experts in learning. They're the ones that the learners are gonna to look to from guidance. And it's important that they um, understand this clearly. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it for me. Hopefully that uh, leaves enough time for a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was really, really interesting. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I just, is anybody asked, this is unsurprising <coughs> that Sarah Cottingham has a question because Sarah is the um, person I was telling you about earlier, Jonathan, who did a systematic review on retrieval practice. So um, her question is presumably if the thing that they are learning is tricky, like a new skill in maths, we'd explicitly teach it and do some blocked practice to get them using the skill, understanding it before interleaving during practice. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I think in, in, in something like maths, um, because of the, the kind of complexity and the cognitive load involved in, in kind of getting your head around a new math skill, you know, suddenly you're sort of learning about differentiation for the first time. I think that then to interleave it and say, well, we're going to contrast this with something else, or we're going to teach differentiation, integration simultaneously, or something like that, feels a little bit unrealistic. I think that's a bit different from a concept in something like science or social science, or really actually most other areas of the curriculum that I can think of. Um, so, you know, it's, to me, it makes a lot of sense that the maths evidence is focused more on practice. So they focus more once you've spent some time you know, focusing just on one, tackling one skill at a time, getting to learn them, then we'll interleave them for practice. Um, so I guess it probably does come down to, as you say in your question, the difficulty, the complexity, the, how hard it is to learn that skill in the first place. Um, it may be that some things have just, just require too much cognitive bandwidth to interleave them in the first session. But there are other examples, like I was saying about some of the things like the geography examples or the biology examples, where learning the thing in the first place is going to be more effective if we contrast it. So it's kind of hard to understand what one thing is unless you contrast it with something else. Um, so uh, it kind of depends, I guess, on the, the, the nature of the new skill and the new knowledge that you're, you're trying to get people to learn. Thank you, Jonathan. Has anybody else got any questions for Jonathan? Um, so, oh, sorry, I was just on a follow up. So, the, uh, the distinction you made between first learning the thing and later practicing the thing really helpful. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? Okay, here's another one. Wonderful presentation. Could it be important that at the end of a given topic, we give blocked practice questions, then later follow up with interleave revision? I think that's similar to what Sarah was just saying. Um, and, and you saying that it's really dependent on the topic on what you're trying to teach. Is that right, Jonathan? Yeah, so I mean, I guess with a lot of these things, it will depend on, and this is, I guess, one of the reasons why I think that the sort of the locus of the decision-making should be the practitioner. It shouldn't really be about researchers saying, in your classroom, do this, but it should be more about you kind of thinking about the research and thinking, well, how is this relevant to, to my um, particular syllabus or whatever. I guess when you say a topic, maybe if you are talking about a specific lesson, um, so let's say you're introducing something for the first time that maybe it's going to be block practice because you haven't covered enough of other things that you could contrast it with. But I think it's probably reasonable that a consolidation phase within a single lesson could potentially bring in contrasting examples. And like I said, you know, with some things like geography or whatever, you might actually want to bring contrasting examples in right from the very start. Um, I think it would be interesting to think about some other, I don't know, maybe, I don't know whether there's any um, PE teachers here, but, you know, things like sports where perhaps there's a case that you would want to practice a skill a few times without bringing in contrasting skills. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Again, it probably depends on the material. It probably depends how difficult it is for the learners to learn that initial skill. But I might imagine that something like, um, I don't know, learning to shoot a basketball that although it would seem to be intuitive to just do it again and again, that would be practicing, that in fact, although the learners might find it more difficult, that actually getting them to do different kinds of movements, different kinds of shots, shoot from different areas of the court, that sort of interleaved or varied practice would actually be more uh, beneficial over the long run. So, um, but yeah, I think it, it really, um, if, 
if it's not practical or if it's just going to be too much for the learners, then I guess we would have to say maybe dial it back a little bit and bring the interleave practice in a little bit later. Thank you. Um, some other questions. Uh, one person saying, do you have any thoughts on what kind of memory interleaving is, is involved in? Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, basically, we're talking about uh, things that will be retained over the long term here. So I'm talking about learning conceptual knowledge, understanding a particular math scale, recognize that the difference between one um, uh, maybe one concept in geography and another or that kind of thing. So these are things that want to be going into long term memory. But the process of actually engaging it is going to use working memory. So there's a certain, you know, there's a certain capacity of working memory. Um, if you're dealing with visual items, you can probably have quite a few of them at once. If you're dealing with something complex and variable, it may be that you actually can't do two at once just because of the capacity of working memory. So, so in terms of the actual uh, learning sessions and working memory is very important as well. Um, but yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so another question. Um, so more compliments on your talk, but also do you have... Um, any studies, are you aware of any studies that have looked at this in the context of special educational needs? Um, there's, there's certainly not a great deal. I would say that the, the bulk of the studies, you know, having reviewed the, you know, the, the research and interleaving, the bulk of the studies take place that, are, that have taken place have used university undergraduates as participants. So not only are they not school kids with special educational needs, but they're quite high attaining uh, young adults. So I guess you could then say, well, does this even apply to school at all? But there are a few studies that have used early years kids, um, you know, kids age three or four, and have found interleaving to be superior to blocking in a very similar way to the studies of adults. So if you consider that things like working memory develop quite progressively over childhood, um, then somebody who had maybe slightly delayed verbal working memory, for example, will, and, and age 10, well, they've probably still got a better working memory than a three-year-old. So I don't think there's really any kind of theoretical reason that interleaving shouldn't be helpful. Um, maybe slightly depends on the special education needs in question. Um, but um, in general, I think a lot of these principles and the spacing effect is similar, I think really could apply to any learner, any level of attainment, any age. Um, but again, it may require a little bit of practitioner judgment because if the learners were finding it confusing or distressing, or like, why do you keep showing me examples of different things? I'm trying to focus on this one or, or something like that. Or, or we're just, you know, we talk about desirable difficulties, by implication, it's subjectively more difficult. So if the level of difficulty was too high, then you might get the students feeling anxious or you know, just switching off. So I think it would be a practitioner judgment as to the level of difficulty and if it was too high then um, possibly reducing the number of examples or reducing the number of categories could be ways of, of still interleaving but reducing the difficulty. Great thanks. Um, so another this is a good one. Um, could you give a very simple and accessible definition of interleaving for teachers um, to, that would include some of the important nuances that you've spoken about? <laughs> I don't know if it's an accessible definition, but, uh, but one, one um, sort of analogy I sometimes use is you imagine shuffling a pack of cards, you know, you've got a pack of cards, which has got all the hearts together, all the spades together, all the clubs, all the diamonds, and you shuffle the pack of cards, and all of a sudden, they're all mixed together. So, you know, if you consider those cards as the examples you give in class, then, um, and you're trying to sort of teach four different concepts, then uh, maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's a more of an analogy than a, than a definition. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that essentially it's about uh, helpful to think about comparing and contrasting items. But as I said at the beginning, what do we mean by an item? It could be an example. Uh, it could be a definition. It could be um, a practice problem. But in any case, the interleaving involved vary in the order so that we're looking with like besides not like rather than lots of examples of the same thing. I guess it very much goes against things like um, overlearning where we kind of look at the practice ex example after example of the same thing. Um, yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> somebody has mentioned, sorry, did I cut you off, Jonathan? No, I think okay. you saved me. 
<laughs> um, so somebody has mentioned that it's comparable in some way to Engelman's examples versus non-examples. I don't know anything about this. Are you, do you? Yeah, I'm not familiar with Engelman's yeah. examples versus non-examples. Do you want to tell us about that, Michael? <laughs> I don't know about it either. Or if you're, if you're not- but Certainly in terms of the comment, I would agree the point about the granularity of the items. So, I mean, if you, if you, you know, in terms of where there's a kind of contrast point, then the, the, the longer the section of a particular concept or a particular topic, you know, the, before you then move on to the one you want to contrast it with, and the harder it's going to be for the learners to kind of perceive those contrasts. Um, so, you know, in, in, in the example of language learning, as I say, that's kind of a fairly new and emerging area of research. But, uh, um, but if, you, if you spend, um, you know, like one lesson talking about the dative case and then you move on to the accusative case tomorrow or something like that, then there's not as many opportunities for sort of contrasting them than if you do five minutes of one, five minutes of the other. Um, feel, feel free to shout out, Michael, if you want to tell us more about Engelman's examples versus non-examples. Sarah has just provided a, a brief description. Examples, non-examples attempt to show the boundaries of a concept like interleaving. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Sounds, sounds very relevant. I'll, I'll need to look that up myself <laughs> Me to find too. more about it. Um, so somebody else has just asked, wondering about the link with spaced learning practice as these sometimes seems to be used interchangeably. Can I tag on to that? because yeah, there's a yeah. question that I want to ask and it's half sort of related. And it's about what you were talking about, desirable difficulties, which I really like as a description. Um, and then you talked about the two different explanations as to why interleaving might work. One's the discrimination and the other one is about attention. And I'm just wondering, um, as we, you know, when we talk about mnemonics and we, and we know that you can you can if you want to remember a list of items you can attach a story to it where you're walking through the house or something but if for some reason that example is in some way competitive or about survival your memory is it strengthens your the ability to remember and I was just wondering whether interleaving and I accept the two um, explanations you gave but when you compare it to something like space practice um, that it's adding an element of stress, maybe because of the confusion's too strong a word, but because of the, the need to switch, sorry, that was a fly, um, switch attention, um, that maybe it's in some way strength, having an effect. Um, not, not that discrimination doesn't matter, but maybe that's an added effect. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to, to tackle that, that first of all, um, I think that, um, it, it potentially could if what we're doing is we're kind of bringing in more and more concepts for the sake of it. But I think that sometimes as a learner, there's a sense of, I really want to know the bound, I want to know what the, what the kind of boundaries of this concept is. And I, I've certainly found this, you know, when I've, my son is going through exams at the moment, looking at his revision materials of, you know, subjects that I'm not an expert in, kind of thinking, well, I'd kind of like to know not just what this is, but also what it isn't and, and where, you know, this, where this is relevant, where this isn't relevant. Um, so I think that sometimes it is about kind of uh, recognizing the, you know, it's almost like here's our categories and we want to know how to sort these things mentally into these categories. Um, and if you only get told about one of the categories, <laughs> and we'll tackle the other categories another time, that it actually makes that mental sorting process a little bit less helpful and effective and probably less satisfying as well, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, space learning, I mean, uh, when interleaving was first kind of really being talked about um, by people like Robert Bjork and Nate Cornell, they actually, they called it spacing because they thought that the reason it was helping was because if you shuffle the examples, you're actually introducing spaces. And they thought that that was the reason. And then some later research about 10 years ago um, tried introducing gaps and still keeping the order, the shuffled order or the non-shuffled order, if you like. And they found that if you then sort of have filler items to, to make the delays the same, the interleaving is still beneficial. But it's only beneficial if you maintain those contrasts. So if, it's, if the interleaved contrasts are then spaced out, so you've got I to example one, example two, and you have a gap between them, you actually get rid of the benefit of, of interleaving because you've made that contrast harder for the learner to see. So both spacing and interleaving are effective, but they're effective for slightly different reasons. 
and um, you know, in some ways, really interleaving relies on actually having things in the same session, really immediately next to each other, um, whereas spacing is really more about coming back to after a period of forgetting. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we've hit five o'clock. Uh, I would just like to say thank you. Honestly, a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I really, really enjoyed it myself and I can see from all the questions and comments that everybody else did. So I will just now say thank you very much for your time, Jonathan, and for everything you put into that. And- um, oh, it, was, sorry. it was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks everyone for, for coming. And, uh, thanks for the questions. So, absolutely great. Thank you, everybody. There's lots of comments still coming in. Yeah. Okay, let me stop the recording. Sure.